the background context for uh, domain name dispute resolution uh, is that we have a, a, a system, a domain name system, which is very much in evolution. Uh, uh, so, in particular, I refer to the expansion of the domain name space by the addition of new generic top-level domains, you know, like what is to the right of the dot, like dot .com, and what is not associated with a country, like dot .ch, you know. So we have this extraordinary uh, expansion that is going on, overseen by ICANN, the Internet uh, Corporation for Assign Names and Numbers. They received over... Um, 1,930, nearly 2,000 uh, applications for around 1,400 new top-level domains. Uh, and they've started the rollout of that process um, and they uh, have uh, delegated or uh, authorised the operation of 160 new... So far. So far, so far 160. So that uh, is going to have an impact which is likely to be significant on trademark protection. Uh, exact nature of the impact we are unsure of at this stage, uh, but it is likely to be significant and disruptive. Uh, so the second thing that I wanted to perhaps point out is that one of the things that our Arbitration and Mediation Centre, of which Eric is the director, does, one of the things is uh, it has overseen the administration of something called a legal rights objection uh, procedure. And that is a procedure which has been available uh, for any trademark owner to contest the award of a new uh, generic top-level domain. So if someone were to register dot Coca-Cola or were to apply for dot Coca-Cola who was not Coca-Cola Corporation, that's the sort of uh, situation we're dealing with. Uh, and WIPO uh, very successfully administered uh, 69 cases relating to contested new generic top-level domains. Uh, and we can give you more details about that if you would like. And the third thing I would say is that uh, we also uh, continue to administer the Uniform Dispute Resolution Procedure, UDRP, which deals with uh, trademark owners contesting the use, uh, registration and use of a second level domain, so that's what's to the left of the dot. So, Microsoft.com, so that part. Uh, and there, in 2013, we had, we administered or we uh, received 2,585 cases. That was a decline in the number of cases from the preceding year. However, a case can concern, concern more than one domain name, and the actual number of domain names in those cases rose by 22%. Uh, uh, so it, it increased significantly. I think that's all I'll say. There's a lot more detail in the in the press release, and we're happy to talk about. It. Thank you. Any questions? Excuse me. Um, it's a very second for Spanish sure. news agency. Uh, could you uh, elaborate on these uh, generic uh, names? Uh, yeah. And what are the names that are coming authorized? Authorized mm. and that are being asked to be registered mm. in the system for, uh, by WIPO uh, that appears to be uh, new and that most of people doesn't know, don't know. Sure, thank you. Um, as the Director General mentioned, the, the total outlay is that, uh, is that um, applications were received by the authority for the domain name system called ICANN. Um, in a total number of something like, uh, I believe, 1,900 or so. But those 1,900 were actually for 1,400, 1,400 unique top levels, unique strings, as they say. 
That means that among the applicants, there were some that were trying to compete, that were competing for the same, for obtaining the rights to exploit the same top level. So in the end, you're looking at a, uh, a maximum potential expansion now of 1,400 new top levels. ICANN is uh, going through this approval process for these new top levels, which includes, for example, the, the legal rights objection procedure, which the Director General just mentioned. And as the Director General also mentioned, as to the best of our knowledge, which comes essentially from ICANN, um, something like 160, less than 200, have been approved out of those, let's say, 1,400, uh, as of more or less early March. Uh, we have, I believe, included a reference for you to a web location, which is actually on ICANN's own website. On that website, you will find, first of all, all of the 1,400 applied for strings, or if you like, also the 1,900 distinct applicants. Um, and secondly, you will find also a more or less up-to-date running total of the domains as they become approved, including the 160 that we just mentioned. Yeah. Can you give examples? Examples? Yes, yes. yes we can. Um, to which domains they are related? I mean, for example, com related, relates more to commercial, to businesses, uh, yes. countries, uh, I don't know. Yes, no, well, it's, 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 exactly. it's, it's, it's uh, pretty much everything under the sun, to, so to say. So it's always a little bit hard to single out some uh, from uh, under the sun. But um, um, if we look at only, if we will only look at the list of the ones that have been approved, then uh, the first thing to note is that those domains will not all be in the same sort of Roman script that, you know, that I would recognize. Um, but there are also top-level strings, domains, that will be uh, in Arabic, that are in uh, Chinese, Mandarin, uh, that are in Japanese, that are in Cyrillic, and so on and so forth. And that is perhaps one comment to make first off, because it shows, again, the internationalization of the expansion of the top levels beyond the fact that every domain, by definition, spreads across the border. So that's one thing uh, up front. And there are examples for this. Uh, for example, on the list here, I see a Chinese term for the, the word world. I see a Chinese term for the, world, for the word agencies and institutions, for organization, which is, in fact, the Chinese equivalent for .org. Mm -hmm. uh, there's Russian for .org. .org, as you know, is one of the existing domains. The list goes on. Another category that I can single out is geographical terms. We have here on the approved list .Köln, which is Cologne, the city in Germany. We have .Okinawa. I believe that probably .Tokyo or Berlin are already in here as well. I would have to check that. It's on the list. It would be on the list. Um, that's a second category that I think is, is remarkable. A third category would be, um, in fact, trademarks themselves. So, for example, I believe that there's the Korean equivalent for .Samso. <coughs> There is, yes, dot .Berlin is on the list, by the way, dot .Wien, dot, that's the German word for Vienna, as you would know. Uh, there are quite a few trademarks uh, among the 1,400, um, and you'll find them in this list. Let me see if I can see There is uh, dot .Tienda. <laughs> Um, so that's another category, and I think it's an important category because, um, first of all, I think that their total number among the 1,400 is, uh, is over a third. So it's, um, that in itself also is going to be having some impact on the way that the domain system is being perceived and used by itself. And then the fourth category, not in that order, because quite possibly the most important in number, uh, are kind of uh, are domains which are intended to be used for their generic, for their dictionary meaning. And that, the list is full of that. You'll see .bit, B-I-D, .vote. Uh, you'll see .best, you'll see um, dot dating, all random examples, dot flights, dot cards, the, dot football, the list goes on. Um, that is probably, the, that's the category of domains, the latter, that comes closest to what you mentioned, <coughs> which is, for example, dot com. Mm -hmm. Over here. Sure. Okay. Yes, uh, Francis, can you elaborate? You said that this new uh, inflow of uh, top level domain yep. names will have a uh, significant impact on trademarks and it will also be disrupted. Can you elaborate why? Has it got to do with what? <clears throat> well, I think the, uh, the principal reason is that the opportunity for misuse of trademarks expands exponentially. So uh, there is no filtering procedure 
for obtaining a domain name registration. It's an automatic procedure. So you can go on and in a matter of seconds, you know, uh, obtain a domain name registration. And there is no governmental or other authority that examines that to see whether it conflicts with the trademark. Uh, and when you multiply the number of possibilities for registering domain names so that you can't register it just in .com, where it may have been taken by a trademark owner, but you can register it across 1,400 or 2,000 or 10,000 or 50,000 different domains, you <coughs> increase the opportunity <coughs> for uh, registering registrations by persons who are not authorised to use the trademark. I think it's as simple as that. Uh, and that brings with it the attendant inconvenience of a much greater burden of surveillance on the part of trademark owners. So instead of looking at what new registrations there are in .com, for example, they have to look at it across 1,400 or 2,000 or however many there are. Uh, and so uh, this will influence, no doubt, the way in which trademark owners approach the whole question of the protection of their trademarks in the domain name space. You know, just how many resources can they devote to surveillance or monitoring of allegedly infringing, infringing domain name registrations becomes the question for them. What sort of uh, strategies do they adopt? Do they try to register their trademark in every single new domain, 1,400 or 2,000 or whatever it might be? Do they oppose every single uh, allegedly infringing trademark registration? You know, I think these are really difficult questions of strategy for uh, trademark owners in this evolving and expanding space. But if I may have a follow-up, does this mean that the ICANN process is badly managed because they're in charge of this and... Well, I'm not saying that. No, but that's the implication here. Uh, I think that um, uh, what one can say is that, is that trademark owners are very concerned about the impact that this expansion will have on branding systems. Yeah. Jonathan, John. yeah. First question was the same as John's, so perhaps yeah. to, to adapt it slightly. Um, I mean, seem to be saying there's a lot of disruption. This isn't actually a particularly positive thing. So, so why, why, why has this been done? I mean, what's the point of it? Uh, well, I can't answer that. You know, uh, I can has to uh, answer that one. They're the ones that are uh, promoting this and who are doing it, overseeing it. Uh, so I'm not sure what the uh, answer to that is. But can you say anything positive in it? I mean, without saying why they did it. Well, uh, let's say that the DNS does not exist just for branding. You know, that its principal purpose in life is a navigational system on the internet, which will help u users to navigate and find their way around the uh, the internet. Uh, so that's its principal purpose in life. So presumably their reasons for expanding relate to, you know, uh, improving navigational uh, capacity on the internet. What we're concerned with is the side effect of the impact that that has on identifying systems or branding systems, uh, you know, uh, that are, that are uh, used by consumers for their interaction with commerce. Jean-Pierre Hernandez. Did you try to prevent this from happening? Why did you fail? Um, I think that you'll find that a lot of trademark owners have, uh, and owners associations have expressed concern to ICANN. And what we have done is we don't consider it to be our business to take a position on the navigational system or in net governance, but our position is to uh, try to ensure that intellectual property is respected in the, on the internet in the same way as it's respected in the physical world. And so we have expressed our concern uh, that appropriate procedures, simple procedures, exist to uh, enable uh, uh, trademark owners to uh, protect their trademarks. Uh, 
Dan. Yes, I was wondering, Francis, about first of all, uh, Eric asked this: uh, Will the WIPO Center's role in dealing with these new disputes, the new GTLs, be exactly the same as it is currently, or does that change in any way? Does your, does your role change at all? I imagine you'll be sharing, um, as it exists now, with other centers. There'll be other centers which can offer arbitration. Um, and I was wondering, when do you expect this wave to break in terms of new uh, new disputes involving these uh, new GT, T, sorry, new top total names, <laughs> that way. I mean, you have 160 granted, and none of them are operating as far as, as, I, as, far as I know, I don't know if that's correct or not. But you know, when will these become operational, and when do you expect the first wave of um, disputes to come flooding in? Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, thank you, Dan. Um, of course, uh, much of what we discuss uh, in this and, and other issues uh, is somewhat speculative, but uh, first maybe let's go to what do we do today and what have we been traditionally doing on domain names uh, in terms of cases and where might it go. Uh, the UDIP established uh, on the initiative actually of WIPO um, has been running now since uh, December 1999. Um, which is when WIPO received the first case. And we've done uh, more than 28,000 of those cases uh, through today, covering more than 50,000 domain names, uh, as the Director General, I think, noted. That is an activity that will continue also for the new domains. So every single one of these new up to 1,400 it will also be subject to the possibility for trademark owners to keep filing a UDP case, number one. Number two, we actually have begun now to receive the first cases under the UDIP in relation to the first of these newly approved domains. I think one of them is referred to, but not by name in the press release, but I can, I'm, I'm happy to give you the name. The first case that was received um, among any provider, as far as we uh, can tell, uh, in relation to new domains under UDIP is uh, relating to the word uh, Canyon, the registration Canyon, like the Grand Canyon, uh, Canyon.bike. And uh, on the website of WIPO, you will find it. You can search for it under that name, or you can search for it under the case number 2014-0206. So that makes it the 206th case of this year. And uh, that case was filed by a, a trademark owner from Germany against an individual who I believe uh, is based in the Netherlands. And we expect a decision in that case, a UDP decision to come out in that case, uh, probably in the course of next week. Um, since then, the first decision yes, so yes. Well, it's the first case, and it will probably also be the first decision. What's the argument of the contestant? Why is he contesting? It? Well, um, what we do not do is we do not post complaints, and we do not post responses in the case. So, uh, what I can say is is that uh, you know, but although we do that will be clear. Yes, although we do post the judgment, and that will. No, but what is the the person contesting the registration? What, what's yeah, about? I understand. So, so while we are not, you know, in normally in a position for, on any case that is pending to say, okay, this is exactly what this party says, and this is what that party uh, defends with. Um, first of all, as the director general notes, once the decision is out, that will essentially, of course summarize and discuss the facts and contentions, number one. Number two, but in the, the best... Process, the yeah. process is transparent from the beginning, so what is the complaint here? Well, the, uh, the, the second what he's saying is it's say, actually before the publication of the judgment, all that you have you is the a, case. You file a complaint. Yeah, but that complaint is not published. Yeah. No, so it's not. Why not? Uh, because it's not published until uh, so until the, the judgment is not transparent from the beginning. Mm, I wouldn't say that. I mean, the judgment puts out all the arguments. No, but the filing should be public from the beginning. The yeah. way it is in most courts. Well, let, let me let me answer that in in this way. Um, first of all, of course, this is not a court. It's an alternative to the court, and it adds to it, and it leaves open the court option. Number one. Uh, number two, it is highly transparent in that everything will come out once the decision is there. But there are policy reasons why we do not post people's allegations before that. First of all, because allegations have to be uh, uh, assessed independently. That's a very important point of justice, uh, part of transparency in a sense. Number one. Number two, it is our experience, and we think that's a positive thing, that not posting too much information about the case up front stimulates the chances that the parties will settle. Why will they settle? Because it's an opportunity for them 
to stay off the internet with whatever the conduct was on either side of the case. So there's a policy reason too, which actually we think is a healthy one. And what you're actually seeing is that the WIPO settlement rate is, is more than a quarter of our cases, and that is not a coincidence. So, but having said that, John, um, I think that the best handle today, so to speak, on what the allegations of a party in a case like that would be, are the criteria, the substantive test of the UGP itself, which is there is a trademark right, and it is alleged to have been infringed by somebody who took the name on the internet without having rights or legitimate interests of its own, usually, I say usually, in the way that the owner of the domain name registration will use that domain name to, for example, include links on the page to other unrelated or even competing products. That is kind of the standard scenario that we see in UDIP. Yeah? Now, so the UDIP, back to Dan, UDIP will continue to function, and the first cases have come in. Kenyon, I mentioned. There are two more that have come in in the meantime. One case in relation to the domain dot .holdings, and another one in relation to the domain dot .ventures. And those cases, if you want the numbers, are again 2014, and then 0269 and 0369. Um, now, how many more cases will we see? That's a matter of speculation entirely, because on the one hand, I think what you'll see is that, as the Director General has noted, trademark owners will have to be much more focused than they already are in what they will address with their, under their enforcement strategies. You cannot keep shooting at everything that moves in an expanding domain name system, mm. not even today. So that is one, let's say, trend that will probably happen. On the other hand, the, the mere numerical expansion of the, of the registrations as such, of course, will tempt or sometimes force trademark owners to come out and file more cases. So I think you have two countervailing, two kind of competing considerations there that make it hard to say which, one, which way it will go, but those are two, I think, core considerations. More selectivity, but at the same time, probably more need to, in any event, still target certain types of registrations. Um, it's, it's a long time since I uh, traded with, uh, with the dispute setting in Bangor, but uh, my, my question is just, do you have any means to, to enforce your, your decisions? Uh, when, uh, yes. Uh, short answer. Long answer. Uh, it's a contractual system. Okay, so uh, in order to be accredited by ICANN as a registrar, you have to agree to abide by the results of the dispute resolution procedures of ours or any authorised dispute resolution provider. So we give the decision, the decision is notified. Uh, to the provider, and the provider must respect the terms of uh, the, its contractual obligation yeah. to abide by the procedure. May, may I just, just combining, just, to, just one more thought that combines essentially the question that you had earlier with what Dan is mentioning, but which what, what Dan has been asking, the question, what has WIPO been doing with ICANN in the face of this expansion? The Director General has noted how concerns have been shared. In terms of the policies administered beyond the UDRP, there's a new policy which has been established by ICANN, essentially on the initiative of WIPO, which is called, with a rather technical term, a post-delegation dispute resolution policy. And what is that? That is a policy that allows trademark owners, going forward, to also file cases, not just as under the UDRP, against second-level registrations, but also against the operators of these new domains, if those operators themselves are thought to uh, stimulate or actually uh, actively uh, infringe trademark owners in the way that they operate the new top-level domain. So the idea of that procedure, although there are many safeguards and conditions that trademark owners will have to meet to be successful in it, but the idea of that procedure is to zoom out a bit from this need to target second-level registrations and see whether, uh, whether perhaps certain domains themselves um, are perhaps contributing in a in a rather obvious manner to these infringements that are happening on the second level. So that is an additional mechanism which uh, which is in place and where we will see whether we uh, will get cases in that or not. It's going to take time, of course, because these domains need to become truly operational in the market. Is this uh, WIPO policy position available on your website that you submitted to WIPO to ICANN? Uh, in relation to what? 
to this uh, new issue on trademarks. I, I will send to you uh, after this a link to our correspondence with ICANN, which is all on the website, and it includes uh, correspondence about this very mechanism.